Morning and welcome to the sixth meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone in the public gallery to please switch off their electronic devices or switch them to silent mode so that they don't affect the committee's work? I welcome Kenneth Gibson to the meeting this morning in place of Alex Neil. Item one, decision on taking business in private. Do we agree to take items three and four in private? Thank you. Item two, early learning and childcare. We will now take evidence on the Auditor General's report and I welcome the witnesses from Audit Scotland. Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland. Anthony Clark, Assistant Director of Performance, Best Value and Audit. Tricia Meldrum, Senior Manager and Rebecca Smallwood, Senior Auditor. I now invite the Auditor General to make an opening statement. Thank you, Convener. As you know, the Scottish Government has a major policy of increasing the amount of early learning and childcare that children are entitled to, with the aim of improving outcomes for children and helping their parents into work, study or training. From August 2014, entitlement to funded early learning and childcare rose from 475 hours a year to 600 hours for all three and four-year-olds and eligible two-year-olds. The Scottish Government and Councils are now working towards further extending the entitlement to 1,140 hours per year by 2020. This report looks at planning and implementation of the initial expansion to 600 hours from 2014 and progress towards implementing 1,140 hours by August 2020. It's the first in a planned series of reports and makes recommendations for the crucial next stage of the policy. The Government and Councils have worked well together to expand provision and parents are positive about the benefits of funded early learning and childcare for their children. But parents do report a limited impact on their ability to work due to both the number of hours available and the way in which they're provided, particularly their flexibility. We found that the Government implemented the increase in hours without comparing the costs and outcomes associated with alternative ways of achieving the increase. It's invested almost £650 million of additional funding since 2014 to expand funded early learning and childcare to 600 hours, but it wasn't clear enough about the specific outcomes it expected to achieve, and it didn't plan how to evaluate the impact of expansion. It's therefore not yet clear whether this investment is delivering value for money. The Government has done more to plan how it will evaluate the expansion to 1,140 hours, but there are significant risks that councils won't be able to achieve this goal by 2020. In particular, it will be difficult to put in place the necessary infrastructure and workforce in time. Given the scale of the change required, the Government should have started detailed planning with councils earlier than it did. Councils prepared initial plans for delivering 1,140 hours in the absence of some important information on things like quality standards, the flexibility required, and how funding will follow the child in future. Their initial estimates of the costs are around £1 billion a year, which is significantly higher than the Scottish Government's figure of around £840 million. The Government and Councils are currently working together to refine these estimates. We've made a number of recommendations to reduce the risks of failing to deliver the expansion by August 2020. In particular, the Government and Councils urgently need to finalise their plans for recruiting and training the additional staff required and funding and building the necessary infrastructure. As always, Convener, we'll do our best to answer the Committee's questions. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask Ian Gray to open questioning for the Committee. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Convener. Um, thanks to the Auditor-General. I wanted to focus on... Um, the plans for expansion to 1,140 hours and um, the report seemed to identify three uh, areas of concern about the capacity to actually deliver on that. Two were financial, um, but one was about workforce and uh, that was the one that I wanted to ask a little more about. The first thing was there seemed to be a very significant discrepancy between the Scottish Government's estimates of the required workforce 68,000 full-time equivalents uh, and the estimates submitted by uh, local authorities and their plans some 12,000 uh, and I just wonder if um, there was any plausible explanation as to why there was such a discrepancy in, in the, the expected workforce requirements. I'll ask the team to come in in a moment, but I think it comes down to um, some of the 
uh, guidance that wasn't available to councils at the time they were required, required to put their plans together, particularly around the quality standards that are needed, and I think that's particularly relevant to younger children, to two-year-olds, because of the higher staffing ratios that are needed for high quality there, um, the flexibility that's needed um, to meet the requirements of parents as well as the children, um, and the way in which the um, funding will follow the child in future. The team can give you more of a sense of where the differences lie within that, okay. I think. Rebecca? Some of the difference, um, councils have included central staff in their estimates and the Scottish Government haven't included that in theirs. Um, one of the other possible reasons for the difference... So, sorry, do you mean ad administ administrative staff yeah, in so the council? Yes, other, so other staff in the council, who, not so just the practitioners. So those are additional staff they believe yes. they will have to employ in order to administer the system? Yes. Okay. Um, some of the difference as well might be to do with um, different ways that they've modelled it. So we know that the Scottish Government have done a kind of a zero based model what they've done is they've looked at how many hours of ELC can a practitioner deliver in a day so they've worked that out as about six hours of the seven hours that that person is employed will be directly delivering funded ELC and that they can do that for 11 months of the year taking into account their their leave allowances and things like that and they've assumed that existing members of staff and all new members of staff will deliver that same output of hours They've then used a zero-based model to work out how many hours are needed. Therefore, that's how many staff they think are necessary to deliver the expansion. Councils have taken a, a variety of different approaches, and from their expansion plans, it's not always explicit exactly how they have modelled their future workforce. But where there is information on that, it looks like what they've done is they've taken their existing model of staffing and applied that forwards to work out how many people are necessary. So that doesn't, the Scottish Government's model assumes potentially that there's efficiencies in the existing staffing model that could be achieved, whereas the councils haven't necessarily so, done that. So is it fair to say that the Scottish Government's estimate is an entirely theoretical one which takes no account of the management and administration of the programme, whereas the local authority estimate is based on the reality of current provision and does take account of the administrative requirements? I think they've taken a different approach. The Scottish Government have just been looking to model the practitioners for their estimates. That's what that's an estimate of. And they've taken into account um, the, the time that they think they need to deliver the kind of management aspects. So it's the, uh, the hour a day that they've given practitioners for doing the, the various things that they need to do that aren't directly delivering funded ELC. Um, councils have taken a variety of approaches and we're not clear on the detail for all of the councils but where that information is explicit, it looks like they've just continued with what they do currently, rather than making changes to that. Um, so we know that the yeah. Scottish Government and councils are now having a series of one-to-one -one meetings around the plans to, to discuss the areas of discrepancy and, and to, to, to refine these plans. We know that the council's plans were initial plans and that there will be further work going forward to refine those plans. Okay. Um, is it, this is uh, back to the Auditor General, is it fair to say though that um, the, your report comments that it, it will be difficult to achieve or to recruit this, this level of workforce, uh, is that uh, a view that you take even at the, the lower end of the estimate of what's required? Um, it, we think um, across both the workforce and the infrastructure that's needed, it will now be difficult to achieve. It was always ambitious, and that's not a criticism. Going from 600 hours to 1140 is obviously nearly double it, doubling. It's a big thing to deliver. I think the um, concern we raised in the report is that planning could have started er earlier when the decision was taken, um, given the timescale that's needed both to train and to recruit staff to deliver this very important service and to build new buildings buildings or refurbish the buildings that are required. Um, so those two things together we think make it will make it difficult to achieve the full expansion to 11.40 by August 2020. Uh, I mean, on a, a couple of occasions in Parliament since the, the report was published, um, the, the issue of workforce has been raised, um, for example, with the First Minister directly at First Minister's questions, and she elaborated a number of measures which had been taken in order to increase training places. Um, she talked about the work that SDS are doing to increase the number of apprenticeships in this area and also the funding council to increase graduates. Um, can I just ask you, just to check that um, those additional training places, that the report is entirely aware of that, yeah. 
Um, and so when the comment is made, this will only provide a very small number of the additional staff that need to be trained, that takes account of those changes. Yes, the um, report takes account of all of the initiatives that were underway at the time we finalised it, which was the beginning of this year. Um, we also talk about a number of initiatives that individual councils are taking, for example, here in Edinburgh to retrain their existing workforce um, to meet the, the demands of the expansion. Um, we recognise all of that and we still think it will be difficult to have all of the staff required by August 2020. So your, your view is, uh, as we stand right now, there is no possibility of training enough uh, additional workforce in order to deliver those 1,140 hours? Um, we, we didn't say that because we don't think it will be impossible. We do think it will be difficult. What would make it possible? Um, I think some of the things that individual councils themselves are doing um, will help. We've got a number of examples here of councils working well um, in Edinburgh, in Perth and Canross to tap new groups of people who um, can become part of the childcare work force in future. We have got the pipeline developing now from the things that are happening at a national level through the Funding Council, through SDS that the First Minister referred to. Um, I think it's um, making sure that all of those work as well as they can do and that individual councils are working with government to refine their estimates and make sure the staff they've got are in the right places and that the clarity about what the, the childcare will look like in terms of flexibility and quality standards is also bottomed out as quickly as it can be. But that's something that really should have happened some time ago, in your view. We think it could have started sooner, and we say that in the report. Thanks. Kenny Gibson. Thanks very much, Kenny. Um, just following on the theme and issues that Ian has asked, um, a number of questions were asked at general questions. Leave an actual fact asked the first question uh, last Thursday on the specific uh, issue, looking at workforce. And all the questions and answers seem to be talking about Scotland as a whole. But I'm just wondering what the differential is in terms of progress or the lack thereof across Scotland. Are there some local authorities are doing particularly well? Are there some local authorities where you've got particular uh, concerns with regard to progress? There is clearly a mixed picture across Scotland and it's worth noting that some councils started further along um, back in 2014 with the expansion to 600. I think the team can probably give you more information about the variation we're seeing across the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think at this stage what we've done is reviewed council's initial plans and we know that those initial plans have already probably moved on. They're in discussions with the Scottish Government. So I think at this stage it's hard to pull out a particular example of a council who's further ahead than others or ones that are particularly challenged. Yeah, I mean, I was looking to see if, if there are any that are doing particularly well that other local authorities could perhaps emulate. Um, obviously, in terms of workforce planning, again, the, the questions that were asked last week talked about Scotland, but there are specific geographic areas of concern in terms of recruitment, because obviously the, the economic picture varies quite considerably across Scotland, and I would imagine in some areas of Scotland it would be relatively easy to recruit, in other areas it would be considerably difficult, possibly in rural areas, uh, island communities such as among constituency, for example. Um, I think there's a couple of things to say before I bring Anthony in. Um, first of all, on Exhibit 3, um, you can get a sense in the report of the extent to which individual councils are um, already able to provide more flexibility in the way that they uh, provide the childcare at a, the 600 hours level. The ones who've got more flexibility, I think, are in a better place for being able to get to 1140 by 2020. So that's the starting point, which is in there. Beyond that, we say in the report that no council has currently got a clear commissioning strategy, right. which sets out, um, on the one hand, the demand from parents, the number of children in each of the um, year bands and how that changes over time, um, the extent to which um, different types of flexibility are needed. And it's quite foreseeable that that's different in a city like Edinburgh or Glasgow compared to the more rural and remote parts of Scotland. Setting that out and then being very clear about the provision that's currently available and how that needs to change and develop would give them a great basis for saying, here are the staff we need to recruit, retain, um, be thinking about changing from other services that the council currently provides. So there are differences, but without that commissioning strategy, I think it's not possible to Thank say you. this council really hasn't got a problem and this one's got a big gap. Thanks. I just ask one for the we issue on, on this same thing. Aye, thanks. No, aye, so there are no there are no real areas of best practice you can look to. Uh, I take it from that answer. But just fi final, finally on this, because I've been given quite a bit of leeway with the convener, which I, which I, um, which I do I, I, I appreciate. Are there any additional um, initiatives that have come out since the report that you are aware of, and uh, which would help deliver this target? 
Um, I'll, I'll kick off by saying there's no single council that we think is doing everything right, but we have got a number of examples of good practice through the report that we'd want to pull out. Um, in terms of new initiatives, I wonder if the team wants to add anything to, to that since publication. Um, there was an announcement about increasing the number of modern apprenticeships, but uh -huh. I think that's the only, the only initiative, I think. Okay. We're aware there's quite a lot of pieces of guidance, etc., due to be published sometime later this month, um, which will obviously clarify some issues, some guidance about, um, some more guidance about flexibility, things like that. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gavina. On Mr. Gibson's point about councils, I mean, clearly the Auditor General said some progress has been made in Lothian and Perth and Kinross on recruitment. And I think, Ms. Smallwood, you said that you know some councils were, were better prepared than others. Is it possible to to publish some of that information to give to give us on the committee a, a flavour? Because as you know, the, we would look to um, to universal and uh, service provision being uh, of equal standard, and so it's really important for us to know where where the gaps are. C can that information be published? Because clearly there is some information there. The report contains some of the stuff we've referred to already. The example of good practice mm. threaded towards it. Exhibit 3 pulls out where councils currently stand. The plans themselves were initial plans, which, as um, Tricia has said, are being discussed between government and councils as we speak. Um, I'm not sure if there's much more we can um, do with them at this stage. Anthony, I think, is looking to come in. No, I, I think it might be a question that you might want to pick up with the Scottish Government and COSLA when you mm. get advice from them in terms of the progress that they're, that they're, that they're, that's being made, given the ongoing discussions that Rebecca's already already mentioned mm -hmm. okay so apart from the exhibits that are pulled out there's okay willie coffee thanks very much for that opportunity for a supplementary here it's on the issue of the eight thousand and the twelve thousand that was mentioned by ian gray there um eight thousand is the estimate by the scottish government and the council say twelve thousand but i've just heard that this additional four thousand may principally be in central staff admin that's that's no is that not what you said there? That's one element of it, right. um, but the larger element is the just the way in which the modelling has been done, um, that the government has, has had to take a sort of standardised approach to assuming right. how many staff you need for an additional number of hours, for an additional number of children. Mm -hmm. Each council has started by extending the um, model and the types of provision that it already has in place for the additional children who are affected. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's surprising there's a difference between the two, um, but we do say in the report that some of that difference um, was inevitable because councils didn't have the guidance they needed around quality standards, flexibility and funding following the child and that's affected the way that they've been able to make assumptions about what it will look like in two yeah. years' time. But the, the estimate of 12,000, you said, does include admin stuff? Yes. Did the estimate of 8,000 include admin stuff? No. Doesn't, right. So, and the, the, the funding that's been provided for workforce expansion, as I understand it, in the, the current year we're in is about £21 million for councils, but it's going up to £52 million next year. Presumably, that will help us to try and bridge this gap. The overall gap in revenue terms at the moment um, between the two estimates, and I'd stress again they are estimates, is about 160 million between the 840 million estimated by government, the thousand, uh, sorry, the billion estimated by councils when you add it together. In some ways, I don't think it's surprising there is a gap at this stage, um, as always, and as an element of um, negotiation and moving towards a, a common vision of it. The um, finding we make in the report, though, is that that gap would likely be smaller had some of this guidance been available earlier as councils were preparing their plans. Okay, thank you. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Vera. Um, good planning needs good data, and we seem to be back again talking about quality of data or lack of data. Um, I mean, I'm looking at some of the comments uh, in the report, for example, on paragraph 26, there's no available information on children's attendance or number of hours of funded ELC they receive. Paragraph 32, research highlighted that councils not knowing details of exactly who is eligible, and so on and so on. I mean, how can, how can we base anything on, on, on this level of lack of, uh, lack of data? There's nothing there. 
You're absolutely right that it is a common theme in the reports that we produce for, for this committee. Um, in some ways, those um, data gaps are not the most significant challenge that councils and government are facing in delivering the expansion to 11, 11 40 hours. We do make some recommendations, particularly around the eligible two-year-olds, where it's very difficult for councils to know which of the two-year-olds in their area are among the estimated 25% who are eligible because they're from more disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, and I think that would be a big thing that would um, help councils to plan and particularly help families uh, to be aware that they were eligible and to access the childcare that's available for their children. The bigger data problem I think that we've identified in this one is that with the expansion to 600 hours back in 2014, um, the government didn't set out the measures it would use to evaluate the success, and that's making it hard both to look back and see whether that was value for money and to inform the decisions about how best to um, manage the expansion to 1140. I'm taking it that uh, the most appropriate people to be collecting this data are the councils. Have they received any guidelines at all as to what data they should be collecting? Because here it seems to indicate they're all using different formulas where they are collecting any information. The, the um, expansion to 1140, there is still a framework being delivered, uh, being developed about what um, measures are needed to um, evaluate it and monitor it over time. I don't want to underplay, though, the problems with collecting some of this data. I've touched on the difficulties of ident identifying who the eligible two-year-olds are. Um, DWP at the moment isn't able to share information with councils that would be uh, necessary for them to know which were the children who were eligible. Um, we talk on paragraph 26 that you referred to about the fact that the number of registrations isn't the same as the number of children being um, who are in receipt of funded early learning and childcare. So there are some of those niggles which are simply a, a reflection of the way that childcare is, is delivered rather than a failing in planning or monitoring what's going on. I think Rebecca can probably give you a bit more information about the work that's underway to fill those gaps, um, but they're not due to a lack of sort of foresight. They're due to challenges in the data genuinely being available in the first place. Rebecca. In terms of um, the registration data, we know that the government are working to improve this. At the moment, the information is collected through a census that happens every September, and it happens at um, a sort of individual centre level, so that the nursery or other setting that provides childcare provides information about the numbers that it has in its setting. What the government are looking to do is to make this an individual child level data. So at the moment, there can be issues around double counting children who are registered across more than one setting. Um, and if you collect information at an individual child level, then you get rid of that, that issue. And they're working towards that. I think it's likely to be in place um, around the time that 1140 is introduced. But according to the report, they're not even taking the basic data like attendance. Attendance isn't cla currently collected through the census, no. And again, in paragraph 36, uh, it, says, it says here, Council, the different ways of apportioning costs relating to nurseries that are obviously attached to schools. Um, not all councils include spend on partner providers. I mean, it just, seems, uh, it just seems very basic data, very basic information that isn't available and must affect what evaluation you can make of this. Do you make a recommendation in the report that um, Scottish Government and local authorities work together to gather better cost data to inform judgments about which models are most cost effective and value for money? And they are, they are working on that at the moment. I mean, clearly, the information has to come from the local councils, but local councils need some guidance as to what information they should be gathering. Is, that, work, is work going ahead on that? Th that is part of the discussions that are taking place at the moment between the Scottish Government and local authorities. Any idea when that's going to be concluded? I, I'm, I'd need to double check and get back to you on that. Um, it's certainly part of the work that's going on at the moment, but I'd need to get back to you on the, the data. I mean, when given, the, given the relatively short time scale to the introduction of the larger number of hours, uh, they haven't got much time to start uh, getting information together. Can you come back to the committee on that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Colin, do you for anything further? No, that's it. Okay. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Hi. Uh, I'm going to stay on data, but come at it from a slightly different angle. Um, first of all, I have in my mind that at some point we've had a discussion, it might have been in the debate that Kenny Gibson refers to, 
uh, about a discrepancy between what these hours are actually for. Uh, and there seems to be some guidance which doesn't necessarily clarify it. So is the aim of providing a certain number of hours to improve uh, children's outcomes, perhaps close the attainment gap, or is it to improve outcomes for the parents? Uh, where is the, the bias there? It's a really good question. We say in the report that with the expansion to 600 hours um, from 2014, the government wasn't clear which of those two outcomes it wanted to achieve. Um, and in some ways, it's, it's, um, it's easy to respond that clearly more childcare is a good thing, and most people would support that. Um, the reason we highlight it as an issue, though, is that which outcome that you're focusing on affects how you go about expanding childcare. So there's very little evidence that simply providing more hours of childcare for children who are already receiving it doesn't um, increase their outcomes, doesn't improve their attainment or their, the, the quality of life that they achieve later on in their lives. Um, if you're focusing on outcomes for children, it makes sense either to cover more two-year-olds with fewer hours or to concentrate more hours on the two-year-olds from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. So that clarity around the expansion to 600 hours about what your focus was had an effect in the way in which the childcare should have been delivered, and we say that options appraisal wasn't done. Mm -hmm. With the expansion to 1140, I think the government is much clearer that the focus is on um, outcomes for children, but that's where the questions around the quality standards um, and how they um, play against the flexibility that um, is available to parents becomes a very important one. Um, and again, that evaluation framework, because we're talking about outcomes over a long period of time, become important. Uh, so that's why we think that clarity about what the outcome you're seeking to achieve is, is important, not simply because we're a bunch of bean counters, because it affects the way you go about it. I have to say, I think that's a very important point. This is, uh, and I'm glad that there's that clarity now. Uh, I might come back later on, depending if the rest of the committee want to come in on it, about the flexibility and the ability for parents to, to access ours. But... Uh, if I'm right, if, if I'm hearing you right, then there's a lack of research about the impact of simply increasing hours on children's outcomes. Uh, my understanding is that there is research saying that access at an earlier stage, uh, particularly amongst lower socioeconomic groups uh, or those with poorer home learning environments, does have uh, a more positive outcome for those children. Uh, if that's right, surely the suggestion is that the government, when looking to increase hours, should have looked more at targeting towards, say, two-year-olds, who at the moment we haven't got a, a particularly big uptake, uh, rather than a blanket, uh, here are some more hours. Uh, is that correct? We say in the report that for the expansion to 600 hours, there was first of all not that clarity about which objective was the prime one, and secondly, there wasn't an options appraisal that said, and therefore, given this objective, this is the way we um, intend to invest the additional resources that we're putting in. Um, for 11.40, the focus is clearer, that it's about outcomes for children, um, and I'll ask the team to talk about the evidence we've seen about the way that's being planned and carried through. Rebecca, Tricia, sorry. This should be used is going. <laughs> so so the, the, the blue plant around 11.40 has been very clear that outcomes for children is the primary reason mm -hmm. for the expansion. And impact on parents would be um, a sort of side effect, if you like, of that. Um, that's important as well, but it's not the, the primary goal of the expansion. So that has been a much clearer statement. There's also been um, better planning around thinking at this stage what those outcomes would look like. So there's been some planning about what are the process measures that need to be in place that you can you can measure kind of shorter term, what you then expect that to achieve in the in the medium term going to the longer term around eradicating child poverty, so, so, okay, so, so ambitious and longer term outcomes as well. So we are seeing more clarity around what's expected, better planning around what information has to be collected to, to, to see whether or not that is working. But there are still some gaps that need to be addressed around still further clarity about the long-term outcome measures and how you will actually measure that and making sure that the baseline information 
is collected at this stage or prior to the implementation of 2020. So we do feel that it is in a better position, but there is still further work to be done. My substantive question, though, is because I accept that everyone wants better outcomes for, for the children. The primary reason might be to uh, reduce inequality at, at a later stage. But is there any research which says simply by increasing hours from 475 to 600 and now from 600 to 1140, there will be a measurable outcome, positive measurable outcome, uh, as a result of doing this? Or might it be suggested that we've just thrown £650 million, pounds, uh, increasing it to the 600 hours, on the basis of let's try it and see what happens? Because that's the suggestion if there's no research saying this is going to work. We've been critical of the expansion to 600 for that reason. We think um, if the government had been clearer about what it was trying to achieve and had it been clear then about the importance of outcomes, they may well have done it differently, either by funding um, more childcare for all two-year-olds, but at a small number of hours, or increasing the number of hours for two-year-olds, which is the um, age group for whom the evidence is strongest that this makes a difference to outcomes. Um, we also say in the report that the number of two-year-olds who are actually accessing the um, early learning and childcare that they're entitled to is lower than we would expect. Um, it, we think it's about 10% rather than 25% of all two-year-olds. Um, now, part of that is because of problems with council, that councils knowing who are the children who are eligible and parents not knowing that they may be entitled to it. And we've made some recommendations for increasing it. But there's clearly a, a priority there about increasing the number of kids who are eligible who are actually taking up their entitlement among that um, subsection of two-year-olds for whom the evidence is clear it would make the biggest difference. Okay, thank you. Willie Coffey. It's really on the same theme there. It was about uh, general uptake and uh, whether you could drill a wee bit further into this. Your report auditor general tells us that almost all three and fours are are accessing the funded hours, but it's much lower for the twos. Um, can you see anything about across the socio-economic groups again, though, in, in terms of take-up uh, for more of the kind of deprived communities in Scotland? Is it, is it pretty high in terms of the three and fours right across Scotland, or is it patchy? The, the way the information is collected makes it very difficult for us to do that because it's mm. collected from a census. It's not individual child-level data. We can't say anything about the children within each council that are taking it up. We just know at a council level and at a Scotland level, it is high for three and four year olds. Presumably part of the recommendations will be asking for that to be collated to allow us to examine this uh, more carefully. But do you think the eligibility issue for the twos is, is one of the factors about whether, because because the take up rate for the two year olds is, is so low, is it confusing or is it based on birthday dates and so on and so forth? What's, what's the reason do you think for that, for being so low? Trisha. They work with, with, two, with families of eligible two-year-olds has found that one of the main reasons why people don't take it up is because they're, they're not aware that they are eligible. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so, so where people know that their child is eligible, there is higher uptake. It's just getting that information to the people to let them know. So we talk about some good examples of how, um, how personal engagement is very important to that. So the health visitor, social worker, um, job centre, etc. So people being able to, to share that information with people that they're working with um, being an important way of getting that message out. But, but one of the big barriers is um, that people just don't know that they're eligible. Uh, and, and it's part of your recommendation again to, to ask <laughs> councils perhaps to, to try to do a wee bit more to raise awareness that the, 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 the facility is there for families to, to, to use? And yeah. there's also the, the particular issue that councils don't don't know exactly who is eligible themselves because they don't have access to the information through HMRC, DWP. So we've got a recommendation about Scottish Government councils working to, to try to improve access to that information so that it can help councils target these, these families better. Okay. Uh, and looking ahead to, to evaluation, you, you, you've mentioned that through the, the report, and, and as Liam Kerr was saying there, what is it we're evaluating? Is it the, the impact on attainment and so on and outcomes for the children, or is it the benefits, positive benefits for families and allowing them to go back to, to work and so on? I suspect it's probably both, but I, I think the Scottish Government's accepting and agreeing and working on these two strands to evaluate, but have you, have you made any further recommendations about 
whether that evaluation should be short, medium or long term, because it is a relatively new policy, to be, to be honest, and the impacts and the benefits of this may not be felt for, for some years to come. So is the evaluation scope looking at short, medium, long term? The government itself is committed to a short, medium and long term evaluation strategy and we set out um, some of that in, in the report. Um, as we've already mentioned, there are still some gaps in some of the baseline data that need to be filled and there's still an ongoing discussion with local authorities in terms of what measures might be used in some of the important areas. Yeah. And in doing that again, will we, are you asking for us to collect data on a pair authority basis so we can see and you know, on a pair community basis I suppose within the authorities so we can get a really clear picture? how this policy develops over the years? We haven't made recommendations in, in that respect, but we're very aware that those discussions are taking place between the Scottish Government and local authorities. Because Mr Beattie here is bound to ask the same question in a, in a few years, if, if we're all still at this committee, about what does the data tell us about the, the values and the benefits of the impact of the, the policy? OK, thank you. Can I pick up a point Mr Coffey raised, or... In answer, um, I think Tricia Meldrum mentioned it, on the information from DWP and HMRC, is there, is there any barrier um, to that information going from the DWP and HMRC directly to local authorities? Is it a constitutional issue that that can't happen or is it just arrangement that's not been set up? The way we phrase it in the report is that councils don't have a statutory um, duty to identify the two-year-olds um, and they don't get information from DWP and HMRC, which means that it's, been, it's just not been happening so far. Okay. Um, we have uh, recommended that the government should engage with DWP and HMRC, both of whom they're engaging with very significantly around the new financial powers yes. on taxation and social security to see if that can be overcome. We don't yet know what the position is around it. But it seems to us key that it, if councils are going to make sure that every eligible two-year-old, at least their parents know they're eligible, they need to know who those families are because that part of the entitlement isn't universal. It's about 25% of all two-year-olds. It seems very frustrating that that information is there, yeah. but it's just not being passed on. Perhaps we can, if we take further evidence on this, raise with this with COSLA and see if we can try and push that information sharing along. It also strikes me, Auditor General, that the NHS, of course, um, has information on how many two-year-olds, because they have data on how many children were born two years ago. Um, is there any obstacle under um, data protection to that sharing of information between the NHS and local authorities? Um, we're, we're seeing more of it for a whole number of purposes, but in fact just the number of two-year-olds or which children are two years old isn't very helpful with this age group because it is a, a subset of them who are entitled at two years as opposed to at three and four. It's yeah. children whose parents are in receipt of particular social security benefits yeah. um, or, or otherwise um, ch looked after children, for example. Of course. Um, so just knowing they're two isn't enough. You need to know sure. whether they fall into one of those other categories. So the information from DWP the HMRC is much more helpful. That's right. Um, can I ask another question related to this? Constituents have told me um, on an, a few different occasions um, that their children um, of age three and four are losing nursery places um, and their parents are working because the places are being given to eligible two-year-olds whose parents are not working. Did you find any examples of this in your research? We found some examples where councils are having to prioritise um, children in particular groupings in order to meet the targets. I'll ask the team to give you a bit more information about what we saw there. Anthony. So I don't think we found any specific examples of the type you just uh, mentioned, uh, Jenny. Um, but there are examples of local authorities capping access to, to certain services, which we, we set out in the report, which can have an impact on the whether or not uh, individuals are able to access local authority services or private or third sector services. What does that mean, capping access to um, particular services? It's, it's limiting the number of places that um, they offer to, to families to, if you like, manage the market. So they have confidence and certainty over how many places they'll be purchasing across um, private and third sector providers and making effective use of their own in-house services. So you might have a situation in a nursery where 
um, the places for three and four year olds um, become capped to make way for the eligible eligible two year olds? I'm not sure that would necessarily happen, and this isn't a widespread process. We set out a number of, I think, six or nine local authorities at the cap at the moment. Uh, colleagues may be able to give you the, the, the detailed section of the report. Would anyone like to add? Or, or I'll look for it myself. <laughs> a third of councils at the moment cap places in their partner providers. About a third of them do it. Um, and it's, it's to do with, it's less about the ages. So it, where it becomes an issue for parents is a child may already be attending a partner provider um, when they're younger than eligible. So they're either one or they're two. Um, depending on when, if the child becomes eligible at age two or age three, they might not be able to continue in that same nursery with a funded place because the council has capped the number of funded places it will offer. Therefore, they, they might be, they'll still be offered a place for early learning and childcare, but it just might not be where they want that place to be. So it might be in a different nursery. It might be in one of the council's own nurseries rather than in the partner provider setting, which is their preference. I certainly know that that is happening and therefore you've got situations where families are then asked to attend nursery outside of their own community and perhaps split up um, siblings to different providers. It can get very complicated, but thank you for answering that. Bill, sorry, does somebody else want to come back on that? It was, it was just um, related to the work that we did with, with parents and, and a number of the parents' stories were similar around that, around not being able to get places at their first choice of provider um, due to, to capacity and, and sometimes that was about prioritising um, four-year-olds over three-year-olds or prioritising looked at, after children or people in, or children in, in, um, in some of the priority groups. We didn't find a particular issue around two-year-olds compared to other age groups. Yeah, nobody's denying it's a complex area. Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, my colleagues here have tended to ask questions you know, in the body of the report. I got a little bit stuck on the summary page um, where we say the Scottish Government and councils have worked well together to expand provision. Then looking at the, the next four comments, we have remarks like, you know, it is not clear whether this investment is delivering value for money. Um, parents said funded ELC had limited impact on their ability to work. Then there are significant risks that councils will not be able to expand the, the care. And finally, the cost um, has significantly higher than the Scottish Government's figure. I mean, how is that working well? I think we're recognising the fact that 600 hours were available for all three and four year olds um, and for the two year olds who were entitled by the date that was put in place. Um, that is an achievement and we think it could have been done better in the ways that we set out in the report. And looking to the future? All the more important that the lessons are learned and that um, the uh, baselines that would enable value for money and the impact on children um, are in place as the money is being invested and not afterwards. That's not the, the feeling you get from reading they're working, it's working well. We said they worked well together to achieve the expansion of the places. Um, the places were available and there, there is a benefit to that. Um, we think it could have been done better and we've been very clear in the report about how that could have been done and the lessons that can be learned. So if you consider it could have been done better, why what they've done as well has worked well then? I think the, the wording is, is um, clear that we think they worked well together to do it, not that everything was done well. They're two slightly different things in, in the way in which the report was drafted and I reached the conclusion about the investment that was made. Now, I think Kenny Gibson was asking for an example of, I think, what was going well. I think you said there weren't any examples. Did I mishear that part? No, I think what we were intending to say was there wasn't a single council that was doing all of it well. There are a number of examples of things that are going well in particular councils um, around flexibility, around training workforce for the future, about, around retraining staff from other areas of council services. I think we weren't able to identify one council that was doing everything well. So this is sort of curate's egg? Yes, and, and we've recommended a number of areas where they think can be improved. And then just finally, when you um, finalise your report, I think you have a sort of a discussion about um, factual accuracy. Yes. And the Scottish Government were happy that this was all factually accurate. Con just, just, confirmed. Um, yeah. Which, without necessarily giving names, who, who is the person or the, the, the title of the person that you, you who would have agreed that? The Director General is the accountable person for it. I'll ask Anthony. Paul, Paul Gray is the Director General who, who, who signed off the clearance comments on the report. Uh, and that was the Paul Johnson, sorry. Paul Johnson. Sorry. Personal discussion. 
Uh, we met Paul Johnson and his colleagues as part of the clearance process, and then we received a formal letter confirming the factual accuracy report. Okay, thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. So this is my opportunity to come back on the parents piece and the accessibility. 90% um, of nurseries have no full-time places, as I understand it. Uh, and many places uh, are only available during school terms. I recall that I think 19 councils don't have any nurseries open full-time and 45% of nursery places are half days. Against all of that, surely the government can put in as many hours as it wants, but if parents can't access it, if parents can't actually avail themselves of those hours, then there is limited value, both to the parents, who we've now established are the, the secondary outcome, if you like, but also limited outcomes for the children. Isn't that correct? There, there is no doubt that childcare needs to be available in ways that meet the needs of parents, particularly those who are um, trying to use the childcare entitlement to get them into work or to increase the number of hours that they work. Um, we show in Exhibit 3 that there is a variation in the amount of flexibility that individual councils um, are able to offer in their areas um, across the range of things that are there. Um, and in many ways, that's why we think the absence of commissioning strategies in each of the 32 councils is so important, because they need to understand what the children and the parents in their area need in order to be able to deliver their own services and commission from their partners the services that will help parents get back into um, education, uh, work and study, um, and to deliver the improvements for children that are, that are the focus of the policy at this stage. I just have a, a very quick question, uh, just a matter of clarity, if I may, so this might be slightly left field, but does the cost uh, only occur, does, it, does a cost only arise if a place is filled such that 1,140 becomes a great headline, but it only actually has a cost if the place is drawn down against, if that makes sense. How does it work? It depends, I think, is the answer. Anthony, do you want to pick that up? It, it's a very complicated area, but um, clearly the cost doesn't just arise when a place is created. There are marginal costs associated with the delivery of these services. Yes. And one of the reasons why local authorities are quite keen to make full use of their resources is because that creates efficiency. Um, and the thinking, I think, of the Scottish Government in the funding follows a child is to make sure that the funding follows a child and that creates an efficient use of resources for the expansion of early learning and childcare. Right, thank you. A uh, similar point to, to, or similar question to my first one then. So if full-time hours are not offered, then parents are going to have to pay for their own childcare or, or they cannot get free childcare uh, unless they pay for the extra to access. That suggests to me that that will have a, and I think there's research on this, that that will disproportionately benefit the more wealthy in society, presumably because they can, they are more able to, to access that, they are more able to have a, a job in the background to pay for it. And if I'm right on that, the very children for whom this programme could impact the most, or most positively, are less likely to be able to access as a function of the hours not being uh, flexible. So wouldn't it have been better for the government to examine the use and accessibility of the 600 hours, say, to ensure that they get maximum benefit from that and on the childcare outcomes, or, or on the children's outcomes, before increasing hours to a figure that potentially can't be accessed or won't achieve the attainment end game. I think it would have been better had they um, had the information to be able to evaluate 600 hours at the point of making decisions about 1140 hours. That wasn't there. Um, 
the process of planning now is more difficult because it's not clear what councils are required to put in place around flexibility. And we know flexibility is key to parents in being able to use this and to be able to make it work with the particular circumstances of their jobs, their working hours, where, how far they have to travel, where other children may be in school or in um, nursery provision. So all of that's making it more difficult. Having said that, I think we are seeing evidence coming through of increasing flexibility um, of parents able to use their funded entitlement um, as that moves to 11.40, and then um, if they work longer to pay for um, top-up hours that would enable them to have sort of wraparound care, um, to pay for it during uh, school holidays as well as just in term time to, to make it work. So that flexibility is increasing. But in the absence of commissioning strategies, it's, it's hard for us to be sure that it's increasing where it's needed and that the ways it's being delivered both meet the needs of parents and provide the best value for money that they can. This is very complex and we've tried to simplify it as much as we can. Um, but this has to meet the needs of parents, as you say, if children are going to benefit. And that will undoubtedly mean an increase in flexibility. The question is how much more that will cost and how many more staff it will need. And we don't yet know either of those because of the gap in the estimates between councils and the government. Just, uh, I was going to finish there, but just on that last point, isn't that something that should have been planned before? I, I, I struggle, as, as you know from our previous mm -hmm. sessions, with this idea that you can just say, OK, we're going to do this, and we'll worry about the cost and how we're actually going to implement it later. Uh, perhaps that's a comment rather than a question. Uh, but I'll throw it to you anyway. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, I think we've said a number of times in our work over the last few years that the, the government's outcomes approach is a good thing. There mm -hmm. is no doubt that thinking about the outcomes you want to achieve with public investment and public services is much better than not. But setting the outcome is only the first step. Mm -hmm. um, and we think this is an example where planning for how those outcomes were going to be achieved could have been done better both in terms of the priority between outcomes for children and helping parents back into work, um, and then the details of how the expansion um, is going to be achieved and the planning earlier for that within what was already a short time scale towards 2020. So planning for outcomes matters, and it could have been done better in this case. Thank you. That's clear. Thank you. Um, Auditor General, keep me right on this, see if my understanding of this is correct. Um, the Scottish Government haven't agreed to the totality of funding yet for the expansion programme, is that correct? They're, they're first of all still um, working with councils to refine the plans to try and close that gap between 840 million and a billion pounds and they are in negotiations with COSLA about a multi-year settlement for funding both the capital and the revenue costs to get to 2020. That was due to be concluded in November and I think is now um, due to be concluded towards the end, end of this month before the start of the new financial year. Okay, because it's my understanding that um, Dundee City Council um, has money in its 1819 budget to meet the 600 hours, but no money to meet the expansion programme. Would that be correct? I, I can't comment on the specifics of yeah. Dundee, but we, we know that the multi-year settlement has not yet been agreed. And it was a, it was a decision between government and COSLA to postpone that agreement to allow more time for negotiation. So that would be true of every local authority in Scotland? That's my understanding. But the expansion programme target for 11.40 is 2021? Uh, it's August 2020. 2020, okay. So if there's no money in the budget for the expansion programme in the 2018-19 budget, it then goes into the budget of the year that councils are expected to meet this target. Is that correct? Our understanding is that the intention is still that the multi-year settlement will be agreed very shortly, um, ideally before the start of the 2018-19 financial year. Right. That's obviously urgent because the money is there for training staff, um, building or refurbishing the buildings that are needed, um, and generally investing in this expansion. And Rebecca's desperate to, can, to add can something Can I just say one this. thing before you come in, Rebecca? It's my understanding that the councils expect agreement to be reached by May which would be too late for the 1819 budget, and the money would therefore go into the 2021 budget, which would be in the exact year that local authorities are expected to deliver this expansion programme. I'm going to ask Rebecca, Rebecca to pick Smallwood. This up before yeah. I dig myself um, in anymore. Our understanding is that the 1819 um, settlement has been agreed and okay. but uh, we haven't got the full details of that um, in terms of the distribution. 
they haven't decided on how capital be, will be distributed yet. They're delaying on making that um, decision until they've seen the details of the multi-year settlement. Because am I correct in saying that this is not going to be distributed on the normal or on the normal formulaic basis? I, yeah, I believe there's there's been a separate decision about this funding. Okay, so they're still in negotiation about really what the need is in different areas. Is that correct? About how the money will be distributed between different areas. Yes. Yeah, okay. So there's a bit of a bridge here to be to, yeah. to between need and and allocation. Even if the money, even if this agreement were to be reached by the start of the financial year, the start of April, and the capital money was to go into the budgets in 2018-19, uh, is that really sufficient time for, say, because there's got to be new infrastructure here, hasn't there? There's got to be new buildings, they've got to be planned, they've got to be approved, staff have got to be trained to teach uh, in these buildings. Given that the the uh, end date for this or the target date is 2020, is it enough time to meet that to meet that deadline? Well, our key message as convener is that that will be difficult. Now, um, it was it was always a sh short timetable. It um, became shorter because planning started later. We think in terms of both training and recruiting the staff needed and investing in the, the buildings that are needed, it will now be very difficult, particularly in the case of the buildings because all councils will be looking to um, put out tenders, contract with builders and others and get spades in the ground where that's needed in a short period, in two years. So as we say in the report, we think it will be very difficult. I I think um, I, I know why you have to use very diplomatic language around this, Auditor General. Very difficult, but um, from the the amount of time it takes councils usually to approve uh, buildings and, and get them built, I I, I would say it's uh, frankly impossible. And councils have no idea of allocation here. They have no ability to plan project. No chance to get them approved by by the time that that this happens. Um, can I turn to something you said right at the start of your report about the quality of uh, childcare? You've said that the Scottish Government has stressed the importance of high quality childcare, but it doesn't define what that is. How much of a problem is that then for you know, recruitment of, of staff and training of staff if there's no definition of what we expect around high quality childcare? We know that quality is key for parents, obviously every parent wants it, and particularly in terms of outcomes for children, the quality matters. A lot of that comes down to, to staffing ratios and the outcomes that you're measuring. Um, Rebecca, I think, can put some more flesh on the bones of that for you. I think um, what we were talking about there was specifically in relation to the statutory guidance for 600 hours. So that talks um, about the high the importance of high quality ELC, but it, but it doesn't define in that document what high quality is. We know that there are processes in place for quality assuring ELC in terms of care inspectorate inspections and Education Scotland inspections, but that document doesn't set out, um, for example, a, a baseline or a particular benchmark for quality above which you have to meet to be able to deliver funded ELC. That's something that we know they are taking forward as part of 1140. They're delivering, they're developing a quality standard, which will be a benchmark standard that providers have to meet in order to be able to deliver funded early learning and childcare. But that wasn't an approach they adopted for 600 hours. Thank you, Liam Kerr. It just on this uh, point about quality, I, my recollection is that care inspectorate data seems to suggest that the quality of early years provision has fallen uh, in recent times and that the percentage of preferred providers that are rated good or better is at its lowest point for half a decade. Given that there's going to be this expansion, uh, what confidence can we have that it, well, that will increase pressure on the system? So how confident can we be that the quality will stop declining and actually start increasing again? Ask comment on quality in paragraph 57 and we report that the most recent information from Education Scotland inspections from 2012 to 2016 shows that almost all centres inspected receive satisfactory or better gradings across three of the Education Scotland quality indicators and on the specifics of the care inspector which you just mentioned mm -hmm. um, their grades for daycare of children's services and childminders have remained constant since March 2014 um, and that means that 
about 40% of daycare of children's services received very good or excellent grades for all indicators over that period. So in a sense, our judgment was that the expansion has maintained quality, it hasn't improved or deteriorated quality. Right. But there, there will be a further expansion. Indeed. Uh, and you're confident that that won't have an imp a negative impact on quality uh, uh, as the pressure comes? I wouldn't want to speculate on what the impact of the expansion will be. Uh, I think already, Rebecca's already mentioned that the Scottish Government is setting out a set of quality standards and criteria that providers, be they local authority, third sector or private sector, will be expected to meet if they are going to be providing funded childcare in line with the 1140 expectations. I'm grateful. Thank you. The, um, you said, Auditor General, at the start of the session that there hadn't been work done uh, by the Scottish Government on alternative business cases on how to deliver this. I think that was roughly the language you used. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary was asked about this in the Chamber during the uh, debate last week, and he his reply um, was that we know what we need to do and we're just getting on with it. What value would it have been to the Scottish Government to investigate other ways of doing this, both financially and in terms of outcome for children and parents? Um, I do recognise the point that um, parents value additional funded childcare. There's no question about that. And the increase has been welcomed by parents, as we say in the report. Um, the point that I was making um, in my opening remarks and in the report before you today is that depending on um, which, what's most important to you, outcomes for children or helping parents into education, training and study, you would take a slightly different approach. Um, if your focus is on outcomes for children rather than expanding the number of hours available for children al already receiving childcare, the evidence suggests that it makes much more sense to invest in um, increasing or starting children earlier in childcare and particularly for more disadvantaged children. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than a blanket expansion, um, that outcome would have led you down the route of um, increasing the two-year-old eligibility, either giving all two-year-olds some entitlement or focusing on the most disadvantaged and giving them a larger entitlement. That's why we think that, um, first of all, clarity about the outcome that you're focusing on, and secondly, an options appraisal about how best to improve that outcome would have enabled the government to demonstrate value for money against the backdrop of the outcomes that it has set itself as a government. That's not in any way to downplay the importance of additional childcare to the families who are receiving it. It is saying that if, you, if you're looking to achieve a particular outcome, you need to do more planning about the best way of achieving it um, to minimise the risk of wasting money on things that don't affect the outcome or of um, downplaying options that would have given you more bang for your buck. Mm -hmm. Given that there's such a tight time scale and we're going to struggle to meet the deadline anyway, do you think the business case stage was passed over because of that time scale to try and achieve those targets in as short a time as possible? That particular comment was about the expansion to 600 hours, so mm -hmm. it goes back to 2014. Um, it was still a, a speedy um, expansion, but it, it's not the, the same scale of expansion that we're seeing between now and 2020. Um, I think it's probably part of a broader learning within Scottish Government about the next steps, having set an outcomes framework. This whole question that um, I was referring to in response to Mr Kerr's question about planning for outcomes being the, the more difficult stage and the one that really delivers the benefits of outcome, we've seen in this report very clearly. We have seen it in some of our other reports. Thank you. Do members have any further questions for the Auditor General and her team? Can I thank you very much uh, for your evidence this morning. Uh, we now close the, the public session of this meeting.